Greetings and welcome to the Bridge Investment Group first quarter 2024 earnings call and webcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Bonnie Rosen, Head of Shareholder Relations for Bridge Investment Group. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bridge Investment Group conference call to review our first quarter 2024 financial results. Prepared remarks include comments from our Executive Chairman, Robert Morse, Chief Executive Officer, Jonathan Slager, and Chief Financial Officer, Katie Elsnab. We will hold a Q&A session following the prepared remarks. I'd like to remind you that today's call may include forward-looking statements, which are uncertain, outside the firm's control, and may differ materially from actual results. We do not undertake any duty to update these statements. For a discussion of some of the risks that could affect results, please see the risk factors section of our Form 10-K. During the call, we will also discuss certain non-GAAP financial metrics. The reconciliation of the non-GAAP metrics are provided in the appendix of our supplemental slides. The supplemental materials are accessible on our IR website at ir.bridgeig.com. These slides can be found under the presentations portion of the site along with the first quarter earnings call event link. They are also available live during the webcast. We reported a gap net loss to the company of approximately $36.8 million for the first quarter of 2024. On a basic and diluted basis, net income attributable to bridge per share of Class A common stock was $0.24 cents and a net loss of $0.05 cents respectively, mostly due to changes in non-cash items. Distributable earnings of the operating company were $32.2 million, or $0.17 cents per share after tax, and our board of directors declared a dividend of $0.12 cents per share, which will be paid on June 14th to shareholders of record as of May 31st. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Bob. Thank you, Bonnie, and good morning to all. Bridge reported improved financial results for the first quarter of 2024 with distributable earnings increasing 27% from last quarter and fee-related earnings to the operating company increasing 19%. Excluding the impact of prior quarter write-offs, distributable earnings increased 10% and fee-related earnings to the operating company increased 4%. Our FRE base continues to build as we've expanded the number of specialized funds we offer and is composed of mostly long-tenured, closed-end, fund revenues. Since IPO, our quarterly FRE has grown at a 12% compound annual growth rate from $24.9 million in 2Q 2021 to $33.9 million as of Q1 2024. Fee earning AUM has grown at a 29% compound annual growth rate driven by successful fundraising, including the successively larger funds in our flagship real estate strategies the launch of new strategies, and the accretive acquisition of Newberry Partners, which now comprises the Bridge Secondaries business. We've achieved this growth through an incredibly volatile real estate environment, which highlights the strengths of our diversified and highly specialized platform. As a capital light alternative asset manager with high margins and limited ongoing capital needs outside of GP commitments to our funds, our business has produced strong cash flow during an otherwise challenging period for the broader commercial real estate industry. This profitability in our platform is a testament to our resilient, profitable business model. As I will explain further, with a new cycle forming, we believe these positive attributes of our platform are not adequately reflected in our share price today. Our recently published 2024 outlook, Navigating the Curve, outlines our perspective and provides details on why we feel so strongly about investing in the areas where Bridge has developed distinctive competencies. In late 2022 and throughout 2023, as rates increased and the lending environment for real estate worsened, real estate asset prices reset, more or less across the board. Although the Fed has kept rates at current elevated levels for the last six meetings, we believe we are close to or at the end of rate increases. The delay in rate reduction has had a modest positive effect as it has actually forced selected real estate asset sellers into the market at realistic prices. 
In response to our macro assessment, which candidly is mirrored by many of our industry counterparts and by much of our investor base, we believe 2024 represents an attractive entry point to deploy capital into our specialized strategies. We also believe that Bridges' patience over the last 18 months has been warranted, and with $3.1 billion of dry powder, we have started to lean in to capitalize on selected opportunities. We are optimistic about Bridges' positioning. We are raising capital globally, leveraging our forward integration into property operations, and investing in selective high-performing sectors of alternative assets with a middle market focus. Importantly, we continue to invest in our platform, building upon our best-in-class infrastructure and sales organization, with a number of mid- and senior-level hires over the past year. Additionally, we continue to find new avenues to enhance operating efficiencies, driving lower costs for our LPs in areas such as property insurance and investor reporting. Turning to capital raising, the first quarter was busy, and we believe the dialogue with investors will bear fruit over the course of the year. We raised $153.2 million of capital during the first quarter, primarily in our secondaries and opportunity zone strategies. While the debt strategies vertical did not have a closing in Q1, we anticipate meaningful inflows in Q2. Our CSG team logged over 1,000 meetings and calls in the first quarter with both current and prospective investors. Capital raising has taken us across the Middle East, in the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and others, into Japan and Singapore in APAC, up to the Nordics and multiple visits to London and then closer to home to Bermuda and Puerto Rico. Across the U.S., we have already touched over a third of the U.S. states and the District of Columbia and are on pace for our goal of having boots on the ground in almost every state this year. 2024 is meaningfully different than 2023 in terms of which bridge strategies are available to investors. For most of 2023, our capital raising was focused on net lease industrial, AMBS, and solar renewable energy, which are relatively newer strategies with lower targets as we build a following. In 2024, capital raising activities will feature vehicles from what we call our four horsemen, including our debt strategies, workforce and affordable housing, Newberry Partners secondaries, and logistics value add strategies. Although these strategies will represent the bulk of capital raising focus, we have other attractive vehicles and initiatives to further drive our business in evolution, such as broadening wealth channel efforts. We launched an accredited investor-focused product within our net lease industrial income vertical in Q1 to capitalize on the growing retail investor segment. We are now approved with several major custodians, including Fidelity, Schwab, and Pershing, as well as iCapital. iCapital is a leading platform providing alternative investment access to RIAs and broker-dealers that do not have their own alternative investment groups. This is an important first step for the vehicle. We believe the combination of the attractiveness of the industrial sector, along with the yield, capital appreciation, and downside protection attributes of our net lease industrial income strategy will be in demand with this new retail constituency. Building on our success with qualified purchasers on the wealth platforms, this new channel represents an exciting opportunity for bridge over time. We have also enhanced the team of CSG professionals who service the retail investor distribution channel. We have added retail distribution responsibilities to five members of our team, inclusive of multiple senior leaders, to complement our existing wealth team with more to come in this space in the future. With that, I will turn the call over to Jonathan. Thank you, Bob, and good morning. In the first quarter, industry-wide commercial real estate transaction volumes remained muted as higher interest rates and volatility within the debt capital markets continued to weigh on activity. However, we are seeing signs of a strengthening transaction environment, with prices beginning to stabilize and capital markets opening up. As of the end of April, year-to-date CMBS issuance is nearly triple the volume of at this point last year and spreads on triple B minus loans have tightened 125 basis points. This gives us more confidence as debt capital becomes more available and cost trends lower. 
but we can't predict when the Fed will start to cut rates, nor how much and how quickly they will adjust. Our view is that the cost of capital and commercial real estate has peaked, and once the Fed gives the all clear from its first rate drop, we anticipate that the two plus years of muted selling activity will bring sellers forward. With over $100 billion in dry powder in U.S. value-add and opportunistic equity funds and another $40 billion in debt funds, we expect markets to open up quickly and values to rebound. Trying to time the bottom precisely and waiting for this signal from the Fed has the potential to leave many investors behind. As such, we have started to lean in on select investments, particularly in multifamily and logistics. In Q1, we deployed over $330 million of equity capital. Notably, on the multifamily side alone, we have closed or have under exclusive control nearly $800 million of assets by gross purchase price and another $250 million on the industrial side. For multifamily, uh, this 2024 activity has been awarded at unlevered, underwritten IRRs that are 30% better than pre-pandemic levels. And on a replacement cost basis, we're at 60% versus pre-pandemic levels of 80%. And at the peak, we were nearly at 100%. While we are encouraged by the increased level of deal sourcing activity, our overall deployment trajectory will depend in part on a broader rebound in industry transaction volumes. The operating trends in most of our property portfolios remain healthy. Despite softening conditions in the market, in our most recent multifamily and workforce vintages, we have exceeded our NOI projections by 9.6% life to date. In our first logistics value vintage, we have exceeded net effective rents by 21.8% on average since inception. Operations are always important, but in the current environment where near-term supply issues and tight labor markets exist, operations will drive alpha and Bridges vertical integration and operational focus continue to drive results. Since 2020, Bridge multifamily rents have outperformed by 24% compared to market rents. Our local operating knowledge and insights are so critical in a slower market for making sound investment decisions by knowing which assets to lean in on, and more importantly, which ones not to. Now, turning to investment performance, excluding office, which is only 1.5% of our fee earning AUM, our equity real estate portfolio valuations were roughly flat in Q1. This is in line with broader market trends for, of stabilization. As holders of assets and closed end funds with long fund durations, we have the wherewithal to withstand short term capital markets volatility as we focus on improving operations at the property level to maximize future exit values. In our credit strategies, the increase in base rates has supported a strong distribution yield. In commercial real estate, the last time we saw a meaningful reset in asset values and transaction volumes was during the GFC. Cycles provide the chance to capitalize on lower entry points and have always created attractive investment opportunities. For example, during the GFC, property values declined by 30 to 40 percent creating a meaningful opportunity to capture value at a discount to replacement costs. The current cycle has seen value declines of a similar magnitude, and we believe will offer similarly attractive entry points. I'll now turn the call over to Katie. Thank you, Jonathan. Bridges recurring fund management fees continue to provide stability to our business in a more volatile capital markets environment. Recurring fund management fees increased 17% year over year, and 11% from last quarter. Fee earning AUM increased 1% compared to last quarter, driven by deployment within Workforce and Affordable Housing Fund 2. Over 97% of our fee earning AUM is in long-term closed-end funds with a weighted average duration of 6.6 .6 years. Adding to the foundational stability of the business, our balance sheet remains resilient. Fee-related earnings to the operating company were $33.9 million in the quarter, increasing 19% from last quarter, mostly attributable to the $5.7 million write-off taken in Q4, along with higher transaction revenue, which was partially offset by higher fee-related expenses. As we indicated on our call last quarter, 
the higher fee-related expenses reflect a more normalized expense environment and an increase for inflation adjustments to compensation and an increased variable compensation. The year-over-year -year increase also includes the impact from our acquisition of Newberry Partners. On a modeling note, Q1 net earnings from bridge property operators included a one-time leasing commission we earned of $1.5 million. As Bob and Jonathan noted, transaction activity appears to be improving. However, we are reliant on the broader commercial real estate market, which could cause more muted transaction-related revenue to persist in the near term. Fee-related margins will continue to be impacted to the extent that we have lower transaction fees and catch-up fees from capital closing into closed-end funds. As transaction and capital raising volumes normalize, we expect to see a movement of our margins towards our longer term average of approximately 50%. Distributable earnings to the operating company for the quarter were $32.2 million, with after-tax DE per share of $0.17, cents, increasing 22% from last quarter, mostly due to the items discussed within fee-related earnings, along with slightly higher net real-life performance fees. Similar to last quarter, realizations were comprised of tax depreciations within debt strategies. Realization revenue in the near term is expected to remain subdued. However, we are well positioned for an eventual acceleration in the context of improving liquidity in the real estate transaction market. Net accrued performance revenues on the balance sheet stands at $320.3 million. In closing, we believe that we are well positioned to navigate the near-term challenges in the institutional real estate sector due to our long tenure fee streams and our AUM concentrated to some of the most attractive sectors to achieve success as conditions inevitably improve. With that, I would now like to open the call for questions. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Our first question comes from the line of Ken Worthington with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Uh, good morning, and thanks for taking the question. Maybe, Robert, first for you, I was hoping you could flesh out your comment on the new product in the Wealth Channel. So Wealth has been sort of a, a big distribution channel for you historically. Um, can you talk about what, what is new with this fund? Is it a different fund structure? Um, is it just sort of focusing on a, a different part of wealth distribution? So, uh, you know, please, you know, f flesh out your comments and, and, and fill in the pieces for us, please. Yeah, good morning, Ken, and thanks for, uh, thanks for participating today, and thanks for the question. Um, We've uh, we've had a long-standing presence in the in the wealth channel broadly defined. Um, our uh, our our vehicles in the past have have typically been um, qualified purchaser compliant, meaning at a at a higher level of of wealth uh, than the than the current vehicle, which is uh, which is a an accredited investor compliant vehicle that's structured as a as a private REIT. So it's 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 a different structure that seeks to build on the um, the momentum and success that we've had for you know a decade plus in the uh, in the wealth channel and 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 offer uh, a, another um, investment alternative um, for our wealth partners to uh, to share with their with their investor clients um, and it's 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 you know the ink is hardly dry. Um, we're just uh, we're just in the early stages of uh, of launch at this point. Very excited about the structure, carefully designed structure. Very excited about the underlying investment thesis as well, which um, uh, which we think offers both uh, 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 the strong income as well as the exposure to a, a, a very strong asset class. Um, so uh, so we so we hope and expect that it will. Um, it will gain some meaningful momentum as the months roll on. Great. Thank you there. Um, and then just maybe modeling question, with the collapse of the profit interest, is there any NCI now associated with the, the performance fee revenue um, or, I guess, performance earnings? If we look at the performance revenue of $13 million this quarter, how much of the 
net performance fees of five point five million actually now fall to the bottom line? Like I'm trying to get a sense of of what is yours and what is not yours given the the profits interest collapsing. Katie. Happy to take this one. So, uh, you know, when we collapsed the profits interest, that was really focused on our fee-related earnings as it relates to our uh, performance allocations. In general, nothing changed there. And so when you look at that, uh, what drops to uh, the OPCO uh, unit holders in general is the sum of the realized performance allocations offset by the compensation and offset by the realized um, NCI. And so that, uh, you know, the, tw the 13 million less the 7.4 less the 2.5 is what drops down to the OPCO. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Bill Katz with TD Cowan. Please proceed with your question. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, so um just want to talk about maybe fundraising in general. And, and Bob, you mentioned the four horsemen. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of help size the opportunities across each of the verticals and how much of any headwind to growth is more a function of the, the macro malaise versus any of the sort of the branding stuff that may have come up associated with Office last quarter. Thank you. You know, Bill, I, I think that our, our sense is the macro environment is is improving. Um, we we tried to communicate that in our prepared remarks. Um, we've had we've had literally hundreds of of dialogue with with various classes of investors over the first quarter, and there is a palpable sense of 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 enthusiasm for what is a new entry point for real estate in the markets. You know, real estate as an asset class. Um, in, in really in large part, and, and when you look at specialized verticals, has, uh, has, has reset and reset in a positive way, um, even as, as new, to, new construction costs and development costs have continued to go up. So in particular, the value of, of existing assets on a, on a relative basis, uh, many people feel has improved pretty significantly, and, and that's inciting some uh, some meaningful interest across uh, across what we what we do and you know hopefully that will manifest into um, tangible capital commitments as time goes on as I said we're beginning to see see that that start and and hopefully that momentum will will change over over time I think that there's a I think that there is in a more um, more demanding operating environment. Uh, there's 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 increasingly a view that you know one size does not fit all, and uh, the the fact that there's a specialized focus um, on uh, particular verticals with with fundamental strengths around them is appreciated. The fact that that there's a there's an ability to you know as appropriate operate the assets, property manage the assets, and create create value at the asset level. Um, in a more demanding operating environment is is appreciated as well. So we we feel pretty good about that. Um, the and 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 you know certainly when you look at the historical performance of what what we really call the the four horsemen. That's a colloquialism. It's just the the, the vehicles where we've had a lot of success over the years in the in the past. Um, plus our uh, Plus our, our our relatively new logistics vehicle, but uh, which has gotten out of the gates very strongly. Um, the uh, the fundamentals there are are quite strong, and and interest appears to be quite strong. Um, your your comment or your allusion to um, to what what happened uh, with respect to our office fund one. You know, I think most most of our investor base, and we've talked to every single one of, of our investors um, who invested in office, understand the, the, the you know, significant amount of, of value decay that has taken place in the office, in the, in the office world. Our, our experience is, is not different than, and in many cases more muted than, um, the, the value decay that's, that's, that's happened with a lot of other asset owners. And it's a, 
a set of unfortunate circumstances that have uh, culminated into uh, in, in, into value diminution. Um, that that you know we either because we're lucky or good um, was a it was and is a de minimis part of our overall AUM, and and we uh, we think that that um, that that damage um, and certainly the financial impacts of that was uh, was contained in our uh, in our uh, year end earnings, and 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 that we moved pretty significantly beyond that. All right, thank you. This is a follow-up, Bob. You mentioned in your, in your own mind that the stock's not adequately discounting sort of the opportunity in front of you, and just given the sharp drop in the stock, I'm wondering what is changing from either the the management team or the board's team to try and drive value, other than just waiting for a more benign macro backdrop. Thank you. You know, Bill, we we. First and foremost, I think have the objective of maximizing value in our investment vehicles, and you know, as 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 you know and others know, our income statement is comprised of uh, of a lot of different elements. One of those elements is is making sure that we have the right transaction volume that takes place. 2023 was a pretty quiet year as it relates to transaction volumes, and and intentionally so. On our part, I, I mentioned Jonathan mentioned that that we've started to lean in to the markets um, because the because of what we feel is an attractive reset in terms of valuation, and um, and hopefully we will be able to um, uh, prove that thesis over the course of this year and next and and into the future. We feel that uh, we feel that the suite of of, of investment objectives that we have um, and the areas of focus that we have um, offer some from some pretty significant opportunity. If you you know if you look back and you look back at what the drivers of our business were um, prior to and leading up to and through the IPO, and you compare that to the drivers of our business today, uh, we have a lot of new and we think pretty exciting initiatives that will take the strong foundation of what we had and and add to that the, uh, uh, the, 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 the potential growth of these new initiatives, and that will create a, uh, an, an even stronger revenue and earnings stream going forward. Not the least of which is, is, is our initiatives in logistics, uh, Newberry, secondaries, um, our retail net lease business. We've talked in the past about uh, 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 renewable energy infrastructure. So, you know, there's a there's a there's a set of multiple drivers of 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 um, business initiatives and and you know as appropriate for uh, for the for the um, businesses that are that are longer tenured within within Bridge. You know, successor funds typically are are as big as sometimes bigger than um, than, than predecessor funds, so that should should provide some growth as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Cypress with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, so I'm going to circle back to some of the commentary you were making earlier around the financing markets. I was hoping maybe you could just elaborate a bit more on your access to the financing markets. How is that evolving at the uh, fund level, at the asset level? What's changing for you over the last couple of months? And as you look out over the course of the year, how do you expect that to evolve in any particular color around where is it more challenged versus where do you have more access? And how does that inform your actions and steps on the deployment and realization side? Jonathan, do you want to do you want to address that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, look, we think that the markets are poised to be much more active. And again, there's been this uh, this you know long period here that we've had a pretty big bid ask spread in in the major asset classes, particularly multifamily and industrial. And there's been a concern over 
you know, whether the options of the Fed are continuing to indicate further rate hikes. I think we're very, very much toward the back end of that. I think, as we've said, we're, we're believers that the next action uh, that the Fed will likely take is, is a rate drop. But I do think that that there's a lot of dry powder that we we alluded to it in my comments, right? There's a lot of dry, dry powder that's also poised and anxious to get into the market because as we see it, the secular demand drivers exceed the supply potential uh, in the next in the next five to ten years in both industrial and in residential. And we see a huge addressable market, big opportunity, and we think Bridge is really well positioned uh, for that. And one of our differentiators, as you probably well know, is that we have an internal debt capital markets team, and that debt capital markets team spends a tremendous amount of time with something in the order of, you know, 100 different lenders uh, on, a, on a daily basis, both looking for opportunities that might be coming from them, from from borrowers that got over their skis on attractive opportunities that we might be able to, to help them with, but also in terms of just be, them being able to provide us with attractive capital. So as I alluded to in the remarks, or actually stated in the remarks, we are actually seeing spreads tighten. Uh, and so if we get a little bit of help from the underlying indexes, which which I think are, are in, in some part connected to and driven by what the Fed does, uh, I think we're going to start to see activity really strengthen, and our our access to attractive debt capital uh, will will be there because we're positioned for that. Great. Just a follow up question on uh, multifamily. I was hoping maybe you could elaborate on some of the key trends you're seeing across the multifamily marketplace with more supply coming online. Just curious when you expect that new supply to fall off. What are you seeing across your markets in terms of rent growth and uh, yeah. anything else you're able to elaborate on in terms of some of the steps you're taking across your portfolio to navigate through this period? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this year, this year we're continuing to see the overhang of supply hitting a lot of our markets, but we, we see that uh, waning toward the end of this year, uh, meaning the supply pipeline really slowing down. And by 2025, we see demand exceeding supply again, which is not going to be the case this year and certainly was not the case last year. Uh, you know, there's this lag, as you probably well know, you, 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 you know, conceive of finance and undertake a project and begin construction. It takes a couple of years till that project becomes an actual project in the market. So we can very well see what the supply pipeline is for the next few years, and we can very well see where the demand drivers are. So so in some of the markets that got very heavily hit with supply, we think 25 is going to start to be a year when, when that flips back around, and by 26 and 27, we see really attractive uh, markets in terms of supply demand imbalance in favor of, of a lack of supply. And, and so we, in terms of what we're doing operationally, uh, that is one of, as you heard from us and you always hear from us, one of our core strengths, we spend a tremendous amount of time getting out ahead of the key performance drivers, making sure that we're attracting the right amount of leads that, that we're closing on the leads properly, that everything at the asset level is very competitive. We're not the kinds of people who want to follow. We sort of want to lead out in terms of, you know, being a market uh, trendsetter and pace setter. And so uh, we, we just were myopically focused on all those key performance drivers and making sure that we maintain the right balance between rent and rent growth and, and occupancy. And across the portfolio, the rent growth is, is needed right now in, in, in the entire market. But as you heard me discuss, when we go back and we do measurements and metrics, uh, bridges outperform the market pretty meaningfully. Great. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to join the question queue, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Adam Beatty with UBS. Please proceed with your question. 
Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, follow up on fundraising. Um, and just parenthetically, when they arrive, I hope the four horsemen can leave the apocalypse at home in the closet. We probably don't need one of those. Um, but anyway, just on fundraising, and I think Bob mentioned that successor funds, you know, generally being larger than than prior vintages. So just wondering for fundraising this year, either separately or collectively, you know, how you expect that to trend? Do you expect fund sizes to be bigger across the board or some puts and takes there? Thank you. Hi there. Um, thanks for the question. And, 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 you know, we share your, your view of the four horsemen. We're, we're hoping that they can be, you know, nice, big, sturdy Clydesdales that'll, uh, that'll be bringing the, uh, the kegs to town. Um, there you as go. We, uh, as, 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 as we go through the year. Um, I think that, I think that, that in the past and going forward, we, we've always tried to marry um, capital raising with what the size of the opportunity is in, in front of us so that we can effectively raise and, and deploy capital in our strategies. And, you know, in the, in, in the past, we've, we've been disciplined um, in, in, in limiting fund size in order to marry that deployment opportunity um, and selectivity with, uh, with capital raise. We're going to continue to do that going forward. It, having, having said that, it's been our, it's been our experience that um, as, our, as we invest in our teams, as they grow, as, the, uh, as, as, as markets evolve, that we've found we found more opportunity. I'll, I'll use I'll use multifamily as a uh, as an analogy for for what are a number of different uh, market segments at this point. We we used to have only a a, a generalized multifamily um, uh, investment vehicle. Now we have market rate multifamily, which is which is for the most part Class B value add, as well as workforce. Um, and in in both of those areas, there's some you know there's we think some pretty significant opportunity. Um, asset values go up and down um, and, uh, and, and transaction activity goes up and down, but the overall size of the, of the multifamily market as that example writ large is, is, is pretty significant and there's, there's ways to expand that market. So we think we do have the potential to effectively raise and deploy more capital looking forward than we, than we did uh, looking backward. Um, it's a it's a similar story with you know different parameters around it in uh, in logistics as uh, as an example we're we're we think we hope we're just getting started in logistics um, and um, our our the, the the team that we stood up you know now numbers you know somewhere between 35 and 40 people um, uh, we uh, we are we are actively uh, deploying capital. In our um, in our, our um, logistics value add fund two, we uh, we are actively uh, we are actively deploying capital in some uh, build to core activities um, around that that vertical as well. And and we think that logistics, you know, when when you look at logistics as a uh, from a size perspective, the overall market is as big as. The multifamily market, to be sure, but our 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 participation is much much smaller at this point. So there should be a great deal of growth there. When you look at when you look at secondaries, um, the secondaries market has been growing really strongly, and um, and we think that you know, from a from a an industry structure perspective, secondaries you know not only are here to stay, but are going to become an increasingly important strategic part of the overall alt. Uh, alt universe, uh, allowing uh, both GPs and LPs to manage liquidity, et cetera. So, so we think that there's a lot of lot of room to grow there. And you know, I could go, I could go on and on about our uh, about our different verticals. One of the one of the factors that's pretty fundamental to us when we try to curate where we where we participate, where we don't, is what the what the future growth prospects are, what the, what the potential for, um, for growth is, what the potential for related diversification is, uh, building on what we, what we strongly believe are differentiated capabilities in, in what we're doing and how those capabilities might be applied in, you know, in, in, in related ways to expand the markets that we do. So, um, so we, you know, we think that, we think that we have some 
pretty attractive growth drivers in place <clears throat> that, uh, that, that hopefully as we, at least from our perspective, see this as a uh, at or near the, the cyclical bottom will be, uh, will be amplified going forward, both through the uh, uh, cyclical upturn, but also because of the secular growth of the, uh, of the underlying verticals. Excellent. Thank you for piecing those out. Um, and then just a question on the wealth management channel. Um, one of the uh, aspects of that channel that's gotten some attention um, at your peers recently has been sort of liquidity features for uh, individual investors. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, overall in your wealth effort, you know, what those liquidity features look like and in particular for the new product that you're bringing to market. Thank you. Um, sure, that's a that's a, a really good and, and and appropriate question because there's there's always the concern that um, that you have a, a, a vehicle that that offers liquidity and then underlying assets that are um, that are less liquid than uh, than than potentially the capital. I, I think we've we've structured well around that. You know, we we have defined characteristics of liquidity that uh, um, that 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 will uh, will will help to uh, help to guide investors in, in understanding what their options are it's it's really early in the in the capital raise for uh, um, for this vehicle we we did over the course of the last couple of years create a very strong seat portfolio that seat portfolio, the investors who help to fund that seed portfolio also do have um, liquidity options around their investment. The seed portfolio has been performing so well that that we I don't think we've had a uh, we, if if we've had any requests for liquidity they've been de minimis. I don't want to say zero, but nothing that 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 has risen to any level of importance in that respect. Um, we. Uh, you know, we invest in we invest in 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 uh, discrete investments that are relatively um, small individually, but aggregate to meaningful scale. So that enhances liquidity as well. It, were, were there to be requests for liquidity, that what, what what we've invested in, we think is is highly marketable um, in uh, and to. Uh, to, to meet those liquidity requests, and, and we do have defined uh, parameters around how much liquidity investors can expect uh, that are relatively consistent with what um, with what other you know so-called retail democratized vehicles have in the marketplace as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, just very specifically, is there an initial lockup period for investors? Um, I believe there is. It, might be, I believe there is. I'm not. I'm. It, it might be a year. It might be a little bit more than a year. I'm not sure. We can come back to you on that. Okay. No sweat. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes our Q and A session, and thus concludes our call today. We thank you for your interest and participation. You may now disconnect your lines.